we have a presentation by Bob Metz, known to everyone in this room. He's a radio host, co-host. <laughs> <laughs> now co-host. Founder of the Freedom Party, uh, co-founder. <laughs> and president for life <laughs> of the Freedom Party. <laughs> and he's also what I would call a, the, the producer of events like this. He's the man behind the scenes, and as he just mentioned to me, I'll be glad when this week is over. So, uh, without further ado, Bob Metz. I have a very brief message for you tonight because I really have something I want to show you rather than tell you. But to be sure, everything that Freedom Party does is based on a single principle, and that's the principle of individual rights. It doesn't matter what issue we talk about, whether we're talking about taxes, drugs, health care, education, poverty, you name it, on any level, um, municipal, federal, provincial. We cannot avoid these issues, depend whether we're a federal, and by the way, we are registering federally. I should make a point of that. There are forms there if anyone would like to sign a form to help register the party federally. But the single thought I wanted to get through tonight is perhaps a reconsideration of a term we've all been somewhat familiar with. I do not offer this as a solution, but just as a mindset. We've all heard the term, freedom requires eternal vigilance. And it struck me after I was thinking about this phrase, you know, I've heard that a lot, the way people interpret it. And eternal vigilance is usually seen as guarding against external threats, the threat of war, the threat of an enemy coming after you or something like that. But I think that more importantly, eternal vigilance requires a personal habit, personal and social discipline, a way of thinking, a way of thinking about freedom. And it's not easy to do. I've only, after doing this for 20 or 30 years, I've only come to this point in the last three or four. It's really amazing. I have to really thank Paul McKeever for a lot of that because he has focused, taken what we've done and just narrowed it down to what the fundamentals are. And I think, and that's part of what this event is this weekend, that eternal vigilance means acquiring an eternal habit of educating each successive generation and our own with a deep understanding of the nature of the principles of freedom based on reality, reason, self, and consent. And that means breaking with tradition, clearly. And this cannot simply be explained. I could sit here all night and I thought about it, you know, oh, I could write a long speech. And I did, I've got it right here. It's about 12, 13 pages long. I decided to forget that. Oh. Why bother doing it? Yeah, I saved you, right, right Wayne? <laughs> but now that we've all shared a dinner together, I think what I'd like to do now is share with you an experience. And that experience is called Just Right. And that's the name of the radio show that Robert and I host together airs weekly on CHRW 94.9 FM from the campus of the University of Western Ontario here in London. The show is broadcast on FM, streamed live online, and anybody can see it around the world. It's archived. You can hear everything that you're about to see online. www.justrightmedia.org. Now the show as such began in April 2007. And I've been doing it every Thursday, and I have to tell you, it's more work than anything I ever thought I'd ever do on a volunteer basis, because it's volunteer radio. They don't pay you to do this. But uh, the University of Western Ontario, their CHRW station, is one of the biggest campus stations in the country. I didn't realize how influential it was. And in the last year or two alone, we've been sitting through all that construction, right, Robert, going around us, even as we were on the air. It's a station that goes 24-7, so if anything's going on around you, it's going on around you. And we've been on the air with people jackhammering in the next room, walking through, technicians. You'll see a little bit of this on the video we were about to show you. But for us, it has offered not just 
a way of voicing our opinions in a public forum, but a way of being discovered by other people too, including famous people, people who have never heard of us or Freedom Party. And it's a way of getting ourselves out there. It's, let's face it, parties themselves don't do anything. It's the people in the parties that do things. It's the people in the parties who are identified with those parties. And that's why we have to develop this habit of thinking about freedom. Uh, a lot of us started as libertarians, as conservatives, as other ways of thinking of freedom, but all of those thinkings of freedom were negative, a negative way of thinking about freedom. In fact, that's something I realize that we're doing for the first time in history, is actually shooting for freedom as a positive goal. Even since the Magna Carta, we didn't, no one moved towards freedom. You hear this from conservatives and people who talk about freedom all the time. Yeah, it's a great tradition. We have a tradition since the Magna Carta. Well, if you look at the Magna Carta, it wasn't a tradition of freedom. It was a tradition of splitting the power down between the kings and, the, and everyone else in the parliament. And it was basically running away from oppression, not running towards freedom. It's a different thing. Freedom's that way. Oppression's this way, and everybody's running that way and that way and all over the place. And suddenly I realized we had to focus straight on freedom. So, in keeping with one tradition that we don't intend breaking, rather than tell you what, we've, uh, what we do, we've prepared for you this evening in this segment is a video sampler of an audio experience, because of course Robert and I work on radio our weekly live broadcasts of Just Right. And I realized I could not possibly do justice to the many topics and guests we've had on, geez, 177 broadcasts already, Robert. So I've been able to select only a dozen or so highlights and fragments compiled in such a way as to give you a feel for the show itself. Even though our compilation isn't even half the length of a, of a single broadcast. But what you need to know about what you're going to see is that every clip you will see had its audio portion aired live on CHRW on some past broadcast of Just Right. And among our guests, and by the way, I have to credit one person here for getting some of our notorious guests on the show, and that's Mary Lou Ambrosio sitting here. And she's one of the big people she brought in, Coulter, Mark Stein, you're involved with all of those people. We had Lars Vilks, Lars Hedegaard, the, the, uh, the artist, didn't want to be called a cartoonist, who was having the problem with uh, the Muslims and, and Islam. And it was really funny having a show, two guys named Lars talking to two guys named Robert. Uh, <laughs> we had uh, Rory Leishman when he left the London Free Press. Everybody was wondering what happened to him. We had him on the show. He came on for an hour and we talked. Uh, John Thompson of the McKenzie Institute, Christopher Essex, professor of, of co-author of Taken by Storm. Well, Mary Lou Ambrosio has been on the show herself. So have Gord Mood and Carol Vandenberg. We talk about everything on the show. And if you think we just talk about politics and just talk about, you know, philosophy, we do. That's all it's about. But we don't just talk about it through those subjects. So what we want to do this evening is we've prepared a, runs about 20 some odd minutes long, um, a video. We're just going to have to, uh, I guess a couple of you might want to just shift around here. We're going to be putting a camera here. We'll move this over here for you to see. And you get a taste of what it's like for me and Robert to go in every week and, and uh, do a show of Just Right. Now these are all uh, unrelated clips put together, but uh, to do them justice, I had to give them each at least a minute or two, you know, for each segment. And this runs about 25 minutes long or so. And um, uh, it's a very interesting experience, and I think uh, what you'll see is not what you expect. So just give us a second to uh, get this all set up for you, and we'll get to start in a moment. Okay, Robert? Yeah, you need the skill. Uh, specifically us. Yeah. <laughs> no one else does it before. Fun job. Uh, 
Um, the fun show. The fun show. There's a. Views expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of 94.9 CHRW. You've received your confirmation, Commander. Now we'd like to be on our way with the prisoner. You know, Mr. Tundro, I kept wondering why you tried to kidnap Lieutenant Dax rather than just present your warrant to me in the proper way. I couldn't figure that out at first. I trust you have figured out, Commander, that our extradition treaty with your Federation is current and valid. This station is technically Bajoran. What does that mean to us? You don't have an extradition treaty with Bajor. I think that's why you tried to abduct Lieutenant Dex. You were afraid the Bajorans would refuse extradition. That's absurd. No Bajoran interests are even involved here. I'm afraid Bajoran interests are involved. And Bajor is adamant that... At least I believe it's adamant. Oh, oh yes. You see... There will have to be an extradition hearing before I can lawfully release Lieutenant Dax. Good morning, London. It is Thursday, January 28, 2010. I'm Bob Metz. I'm Robert Bond. And this is Just Right on CHRW 94.9 FM. Where we will be with you from now to noon. No, no, not right wing. Just right. Color it to black and white Under the bed clothes Everything will be alright and welcome to the show today, where 519-661-3600 is always a number you can call to leave us your comments and opinions and express what you have to say to us. We have on the line from Vancouver a good friend of mine who I have not spoken to in many, many a year. Mark Emery, are you there? No, oh, I'm there. Hi, Mark. <laughs> How are you, Mark? Oh, feeling good, feeling good. Except I could be extradited at any moment. We were just um, talking. About, we were just talking about what might happen if that would occur while you were on the air speaking to us. <laughs> I want to make sure I get a chance to speak to the officer in charge, if I could, eh? If that happens. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you remember the last time we talked and we're actually with each other? What was that? It was actually, uh, it had to be seven years ago. I oh think my that's God. what Paul figured out. That's how time flies, and it was the day you were in our office, and uh, Ernie Eves called the election that day that we put 130,000 pieces of literature in the uh, National Post. Do you remember that? Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's right. And uh, before we carry on, Mark, got to introduce our other guest. In the studio joining us is Paul McKeever. Uh, producer of The Principle of Pot, a 100-minute biography and documentary released on YouTube about 10 days ago. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Robert. And, Good morning, uh, Paul. And Paul, Paul, of course, most people also know you as the leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. You're a lawyer up in working in the Oshawa area. Right. And um, you've never met Mark Emery personally, have you? No, I've not. I, I've spoken with him on the phone a couple of times, but I've never met him face-to-face. -face. Now, if it were up to you, would abortion be illegal? Yes. What would be what would be your ideal penalty, say, for a woman who had an abortion or a doctor who performed one? Would death? Death. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I warned you about her humor. I, I'm so glad you added. I'm just kidding because, to be honest with you, your answer is perfectly consistent with that belief. No, uh, it is. not not really. The no, point well, it, is. Look, I, I think bank robbery should be illegal, but it, but I don't know exactly, you know, what the penalties are, how you, um, you know, what the, what the levels of mitigation and aggravation in the crime are. I mean, these are state criminal law issues. On September 14, 2001, you said that America should have been Muslim countries and, and convert them to Christianity. You also said that they should get all the Muslims to boycott all airlines. When asked what the alternative modes of transportation were, you suggested flying carpet. <laughs>
you, you dropped a line from the first quote. It was invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity. So, uh, um, you'll see, in, at least on American college campuses, If only the Raiders had a better grasp of the concept of capitalism. Well, that's, that's true. <laughs> Their first attempt to portray what they regarded as a race of pure capitalists was the Ferengi, an ugly, goblin-like, squat race of deceiving, conniving, untrustworthy con artists who brandished whips and kept their women naked and at home. Sound like any capitalist you know about? I don't know. <laughs> Around the same, same time, Bob, we had Captain Picard declare that Quote, people are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things, he said disgustingly. Yeah, we have eliminated. Meanwhile, meanwhile, almost every other episode is about somebody obsessed with the accumulation <laughs> of things. <laughs> right. He says, we have eliminated hunger, want, and the need for possessions, unquote. But from what I saw, Bob, Picard possessed a lot of stuff. No kidding. From the clothes on his back to a, a saddle, of all things. Well, not only that, I would say that the Enterprise itself was a rather notable possession. No, no, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. piece of property worth something there. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, although everybody in the 24th century was on the dole. Yeah, they all worked for credits and worked for nothing and were just given things for free. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, once uh, Star Trek contradicts itself again in Deep Space Nine when we see the Federation actually use the system, as you say, credits. And the crew aboard DS9 and the Ferengi and other species use gold press latinum to trade with. So I don't know. There's the contradiction. Sure, they have again. money and they play poker all the time. They oh, sit and play yeah. in cards. What are they doing? Uh, just just for fun? Do you ever have a game of poker just for chips? Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Real exciting. fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm nitpicking on Star Trek, but sometimes when a great show like that comes along, you expect perfection. And you forget that thousands of different people from all kinds of philosophies and backgrounds came together over the last 40 odd years to create this epic and uh, it couldn't be perfectly consistent but to continue some of the things you might think we would all agree on and i have my doubts about but what about the borg nasty right who would want to be a borg well really if you think about it the the only thing about the borg which was frightening was their lack of choice when it came to being assimilated you know mind you that's a, that's a pretty good point <laughs> <laughs> but after that if you get beyond that you know i want to be assimilated i was thinking saying? the other day when i went and bought a bluetooth earpiece for my cell phone so as not to run afoul of the new law on handheld devices while driving that we, as a culture, appear to be getting closer and closer to the technology of the Borg. We wear glasses, at least I do, to improve our vision. We have headphones to talk to almost anyone in the world at any time. We have prosthetic limbs, cochlear implants, artificial hearts. Oh, and now in Canada, Bob, the Kindle, which allows us to carry a good chunk of the total knowledge of our species in our pockets. In many cases, at least, with the Bluetooth uh, airpiece while driving, resistance is futile. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to say nothing... Or you'll be fined. <laughs> and, and nanotechnology is uh, something... That's the first time I ever heard oh, about yes. it. It was in Star Trek, and I, th I thought... I said, okay, that's over the top. That's stupid. That'll never happen. I find out it's already happening. Oh, it is, yeah. A and interestingly enough, I don't have the reference in front is, of me. But... <clears throat> it's, it's a thing that a number of writers have written about. Um, including uh, uh, French writers um, uh, about how democracies are themselves vulnerable to being penetrated and undermined from inside. The very strength of democracies are its openness, its, and particular democracies, which is also rule of laws, which is our democracy, Canadian democracy, British democracy, etc. Um, its strength is its openness, its inclusiveness, the rule of law, and then those strengths can be turned around. The very fact that it's open, the very fact that it's a rule of law, the very fact that it's transparent, those can be used as a weapon to challenge the existing system and 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 put the existing system under trial, which is what is happening with what, what uh, Ezra Levant has been writing about mm -hmm. in the book. We'll Shea. certainly be talking about that in uh, detail uh, a little later uh, on. Uh, precisely. For students of history, politics, and philosophy, the free fall of the Islamic civilization into its own dark age since the lights went out has stood as a cautionary tale. The most recent example of this story is the implosion and disintegration of the mighty Soviet Union where policing free speech 
eventually brought about his demise. The communist rulers in Moscow, as those in ancient Baghdad, were dismissive of the obvious in the words of Elias Canetti, the Bulgarian-born writer and the Nobel Prize winner for literature in 1989, that the origin of freedom lies in breathing, and the end result was predictable. In his book, Ezra Levant provides us with a baffling array of stories of how utterly Orwellian are the HRC and what they do, and the personnel hired to administer them. I see my friend rising, so I have to cut short. But I want to end this part by bringing something that Ezra himself didn't know about it. So if you give me a couple of more minutes, my friend. Are you standing up to put me down? <laughs> That's free speech, the worst sorts. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that my eye was caught by this whole scandal in America. Ooh, the scandal in America. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, that must be the biggest scandal since Watergate Gate. Since what? Well, I think the American government hasn't been this screwed since, well, I think you have to go all the way back to Watergate Gate. Watergate Gate? Isn't it just Watergate? No, that would mean it was just about water. No, it was a scandal, or gate, at the suffix gate, that's what you do with a scandal, involving the Watergate Hotel, so it's called the Watergate Scandal, or Watergate Gate. But doesn't the term gate, meaning a scandal, come from Watergate? What? Take the last four letters of a previous scandal or hotel and add it on to all future scandals? That can't be the system. I think it is. Well, what if there's a scandal about water? What do you call that? Well, you'd call it Watergate. <laughs> um... Aquagate? It's not great, is it? No, it's not. Aquagate is going to be the next scandal after this green stuff, because that's the next platform on which the movement's planning to do its anti-capitalist stuff. By the way, we had a caller on the line there who said he had a lot to tell us, so he's going to email us instead. Registration Think step of the one. Sort. I said that I licensing if... is aimed at reducing the risk that people shouldn't have guns, get access to guns, registration track guns. I certainly never said did, did you that not, those prevent well, gun ownership. She said no when I asked her if I have a right to own a gun. She you said, don't have a right well, to own a gun. Well, You, you do mean, not have a right to own a gun. There is no right, right, right to, own to own a gun. Guns. No, but well, you <laughs> are able to own guns in Canada provided you comply why should with I the not law. Be able to have, why should I myself not be allowed to own a gun? This is a personal issue, you know. It's not an issue of just statistics and, and 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 licensing and collecting taxes and thinking you're doing something. I don't think it's doing anything. Well, I'm, I'm assuming what she's saying is uh, that if you pass the requisite tests and so on, then obviously, just like a driver's light, you've got to pass, you know, to I'm drive not, a car. I'm not arguing about those pass. kind of so issues. So uh, uh, the question I have for you, though, uh, Freedom Party of, of, of Ontario, Freedom Party of Canada, obviously, mm -hmm. one would suggest that means all freedoms, all personal rights, and so on and so forth. Combined with personal responsibility. And personal responsibility. Absolutely. So, if the federal government says to you that you're a gun owner and to, and to be able to, to own that gun, you have to pass a, a test and have a firearms acquisition certificate and a license, how does that violate one's freedom? It depends on where you want to have the gun. You know, in, in, in going back in history, gun, you only registered, reg registered a weapon if you wanted to carry it outside your own property. You got a, you got a, a license to carry a gun in public, so to speak. And I wouldn't have a real objection to that because the government owns the public property. But in your home, that's a, that's a sacrosanct place. And whatever you own there doesn't have to be registered if you're not going to take it out of your home or if you're only going to have a restricted use for it. There are hunting clubs, there are private militias, there are uh, all sorts of uses for guns that besides killing and suicide and all those kinds of things. And, and self-defense, I think, is one of the critical ones. It's one of the most basic rights that you as an individual have. And, and gun control is not in isolation. You've you got to realize that they have banned mace, they have banned um, these, not killings, but, but self-defensive weapons that you're not even allowed to have. So there's a, there's a movement in our country to deny the right of self-defense to the citizen and to monopolize it with the police. And, and <coughs> being the music, the music illiterate I am in terms of maybe the current scene of what's hot and not, 
Um, what is hot now? Like, what, what, what's, what's big in music these days? Um, believe it or not, there's a lot of the, the whole sampling process of old music, mm. um, of sampling, of old, cool, roots reggae beats, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, that's slowly making, not slowly, actually, it's pretty much in the forefront of, of making its way back into, in a lot of rap and hip-hop, um, borrowing old jazz samples, borrowing old reggae samples, borrowing old, even East Indian samples, you know. I know Madlib, he's a uh, hip-hop producer and and uh, his one whole album was dedicated to using old Indian records and sampling those those cool sounds that are you know a little bit of that low finest and then throwing over a rap on top which is which is kind of interesting and really cool I enjoy uh, I, I enjoy think, the throwback I, I actually think I know what you're talking about there isn't that similar <laughs> to what, what's that kind of music Bhangra. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like that stuff yeah. sure. it can be a lot of fun it's a great it, sense of life to that stuff. It, there sure is and I you know I find myself I'm I'm probably a quote-unquote alternate kind of guy anyway in the sense of I like different stuff and I find uh, uh, even when I'm cruising around on the car looking for stations uh, I might even find myself on a foreign language station mm -hmm. and uh, then discover it's CHRW <laughs> you know because they're playing something different you sure, know? Yeah. and I don't care that I don't understand the words to exactly. all the songs you know some of them are just great you music know? is universal it, 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 it is the universal language um, I noticed you mentioned um, Oh, what was it? Roots, Roots Reggae, which is something. Well, I, I loved Roots Reggae. Mm -hmm. I was a real Bob Marley freak when Bob Marley came out, and um, was saddened by his death, his early death, because I thought he had a form of music. I always thought thought of Bob Marley and the Whalers sort of as uh, the Beatles of reggae in sure. a sense. Oh, yeah. You know, um, certainly very intelligent music if you read the words and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, isn't th th that whole? trend though of sampling music is some people I've heard they, they criticize that as being not too creative because you're borrowing on old stuff which basically is what you do even in almost any exactly. sort of field hmm. yep. but in music I guess it's it's frowned upon a bit or is it not is that an accepted thing now I remember were, were there even copyright issues at one time because you know to sample stuff there was some battling I remember with uh, David Axelrod who's a big jazz musician from back in the day and I know that Snoop Dogg was borrowing a lot of his um, samples and things like that um, in some of his music so that was really brought to the forefront because as a jazz musician uh, back in the day he wasn't getting a lot of money um, and then for him it wasn't really fair that his music was being used and he wasn't making a penny off of it mm. um, so I'm not sure exactly how that panned out to to work out in terms of um, the the regulations and all that kind of stuff of sampling I know that's something that they're focusing on right now to kind of um, pinpoint what exactly it is and how much you use of each song before there's, you know, the royalties and stuff involved. Um, Turntablism is one thing that they're looking at. I know the NCRAs, which is the Na National Campus Community Radio Association that we're a part of, are really looking into turntablism. Um, in turntablism? Terms yeah. Mm. Turntableism? That's an ism I haven't come across <laughs> before. <laughs> uh, basically, the drill there with, with turntablism is you have you have an artist, a, a DJ, mm -hmm. who's, who's uh, playing records, uh, scratching them, playing them backwards, yeah. uh, cutting them back and forth, uh, taking... Uh, uh, something that's original first, and then changing it in such a way that it's it's a completely a new work. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really, and so so I mean it's in a lot of cases completely undistinguishable from uh, from the the first work. Like no. it's uh, use a beat or a horn section or something here, right? Acapella, acapella, something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so the argument is that if that artist is Canadian uh, and he's he that he or she is producing that that music in Canada, then that should be considered Canadian. Despite the fact that the source music may not be Canadian, they're they're wrangling with that right now at this year to see level. But then Mother Earth, aroused by man's violence, responded with volcanic violence of her own. I believe in preemptive force right now because we live in a dangerous world. It's no longer the sword of Damocles hanging over our head. It's the ICBM of Damocles. Now, does that mean I like war? Of course I don't. That's so simplistic. I hate war like everybody else. I guess I like war about as much as most pro-choice advocates like abortion. It's an unfortunate reality of life. There, if that helps you to get your head around it, don't think of it as a war. Think of it as choosing to abort Saddam Hussein. Welcome back. 
CHRW 94.9 FM. I'm Robert Vaughn, and I'm with uh, Robert Metz. And you can call 519-661-3600 to join the conversation. Check us out on the website at chrwradio.com and just write uh, bdo.org. Correct. Now, Bob, you were uh, before the break talking a lot about why countries might want to go to war as, as, a, as a whole. I'd like to say a few things about why individuals go to fight. Now, yesterday, we honored the war dead by remembering their courage and their suffering the risking of their lives. Some might say sacrifice, but that word, as you mentioned earlier, is often used erroneously. Now, why would a young man want to carry a rifle, be shipped overseas to fate, face great hardship and possibly even death? Why did 60,000 Canadians and 10,000 Newfoundlanders die during World War I? Why did over 40,000 Canadians and Newfoundlanders die in World War II? Now, I say Newfoundlanders, of course, because Newfoundland was not of Canada at the time. And, oh, it has nothing to do with the fact that you're from there, right? Eh? <laughs> uh, maybe a little. I always want to get that little dig in there for my hometown. Now, now, now you have a military background yourself, don't oh, you? I was in the reserves for yeah. about a year or two, yeah, so. So you're not alien, as alien to the military as I would be, say. No, it wasn't because I wanted to fight, it was because no. I liked blowing up things. Okay, there you go. <laughs> now, of course, we're going to hear both sides of the issue. Look, when, a, when recession hits, we don't know who's going to be affected and how. You're going to find middle-class people that are going to be drastically affected. They're going to end up part of what, what's known as the poor in this country. It's, there's no simple solution. When something like this hits, people end up losing their houses. The poor get poorer, as they say. The rich get richer. So the question is, do we need to put a poverty plan in place? Do we know enough to put one in place? And how do we do so? It's been suggested here that we need to look at issues like minimum wage, perhaps increasing minimum wage. This is something yeah. that's being discussed uh, <laughs> quite a bit. That's one of the a, strategies. I don't think we need a poverty plan. I think we need a wealth plan. And we need a plan to make our nation wealthier, make our province wealthier, and forget about poverty. Because if you're, all you're thinking about is poverty, that's where you're going to head. And that's exactly what we've been doing. Well, and, and now, the way call. to create wealth mm -hmm. is to do almost everything the opposite of what's being advocated by the so-called poverty. <laughs> People mm -hmm. want to eliminate poverty. I've heard it all before. I've got newspaper clippings going back years and years and years that read exactly like that. We've got to start a poverty plan. We're going to wipe out child poverty by the year 2000. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it's all ridiculous because it's based on a completely false assumption that poverty is somehow uh, that, that it can be erased just magically by giving people money or taking money from those who earn it and giving it to those who don't. That doesn't eliminate poverty. Poverty is a much broader condition. And if you want to identify poverty, to define it, which is a big issue that they talk about, uh, we only talk about relative poverty. If you've got Peter and Paul on an island by themselves and they're both poor, dirt poor, then neither of us would consider them poor. But as soon as one of them worked, and created some wealth and built a little hut, he'd be rich and the other guy would be poor and that would be the end of it. And all of a sudden, that man's virtue who built something is considered evil and the person who did nothing is considered deserving and needs the other person's help. And that is a very destructive philosophy, I think, to any society that practices it. And that's what you see in most government programs. It's a different matter. It's totally different from charity, from other ways of helping, but when the government gets into it, they can't do anything. Government has no resources of its own. It takes them from other people. Those other people are invariably the middle class. The middle class gets beat from both ends through corporate welfare and through welfare for the poor, and that's why they're hurting so much. So I, I, don't, I don't know what solution you're going to have other than a layoff, lower taxes, um, you know, get rid of the minimum wages for heaven's sake. You don't need the minimum wage. If you can't afford to work for something that somebody's going to offer you, you won't work for them. It's automatic that you wouldn't do so, wouldn't you? Michael. Well, hey, go to it, Michael. <laughs> you know, we, Canada and, and, and Ontario and, uh, and, and Southern Ontario in particular in the last 10, 15 years has been fantastically wealthy. We've generated more wealth than we've ever generated in the history of this region. And yet, we've also generated more poverty. And uh, yes, you can measure poverty in things like the number of people who are evicted because they can't pay their rent. You can measure poverty uh, in terms of the number of people who can't afford to put food on the table uh, and therefore are starving. They're going for days without, uh, for a day without eating and they have to go to food banks in order to get food. So you can measure poverty. But what's important is that many countries around the world are realizing that there are in fact effective strategies to end poverty. The United Kingdom has a, a strategy to end poverty. Ireland has one of the best strategies to end poverty. So there's no uh, poverty and, over and, there? And Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's, it's being reduced. What's Newfoundland and Labrador has adopted.
adopted one. What, okay, before before we Interesting, go on. Interesting, Barbara Kay, who was on uh, from the National Post, she was on the show just two weeks ago, and on another subject, but she had this article about euthanasia um, in the Post. What's the date on here? September twenty third, and basically it's it's a memo to my children. She says, and to to get to the point, she's going, my dear family, I do not want to be bumped off. I can't state the case more unequivocally than that. I don't care if I'm a burden to you. You were once for me. That's how life works. I don't care how long it takes for me to die. I don't care how in inconvenient it is to the medical system. I don't care how selfless an example other parents are setting and graciously exiting the world for the, their dependent's sake before nature intended, which is exactly the scenario that was given in that Star Trek clip just before. Yeah. And um, you had some interesting observations about Star Trek in that regard. Oh, there, didn't you? Um, yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was researching some audio clips like that Worf and uh, Riker one at mm -hmm. the beginning, um, I came across a site, you know, memoryalpha.org. A lot of Trekkies out there might recognize that. But apparently, there are so many instances of suicide, attempted suicide, assisted suicide, failed suicides, <laughs> euthanasia <laughs> in Star Trek. You wonder whether or not that it's a running theme with the show. For example, Leonard McCoy pulled the plug on his father. Remember that in the movie, oh, The Final I Frontier? All about that. Yeah. yeah, huge guilt, guilt things over that too. I guess. Uh, what is it? Commander Data destroyed um, uh, the scimitar. It was in the Star Trek Nemesis. He actually committed suicide. Data dies. Well, actually, he died for what he believed to be a, a higher value, of course. But it was a suicide. Um, Spock died by committing suicide, you know, in the movie uh, The Wrath of Khan. Remember that oh, of one? Of course, yeah. Now, mind you, he came back because he gave his katra or whatever big that was mistake, to... Big mistake, big <laughs> mistake. Not that I didn't want Spock back. They, what, they, in a show where you've got time travel, do you have to bring people back to life? It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot. We're out of here. And we hope the rest of you will join us again next week when we continue our journey in the right direction. Until then, you know what to do. Be right, stay right, do right, act right, think right, and be right back here. Fade into color, and color into black and white. Under the bed clothes, everything will be... The Super Bowl this year was kind of interesting because they ran three and a half, four hours of a salute to America brought to us by the NFL. So by the time they were kicking off, I was actually sick of freedom. <laughs> I pine to be enslaved. Uh, yeah. So now you have an idea of what it's like to do just right. And that's what Robert and I have been doing for the past year and a half together, and I've been doing for four years. And what we've done is pretty well integrated our philosophy of freedom into discussions of just about everything we can talk about, whether it's art, music, you name it, we get it in there. Uh, you're going to want to get right back to that light just for a second, Robert. Um, so that's it for Robert's and my part. Now, before we introduce you to our next guest, and that'll be Robert's job. But first, as you know, our party leader, Paul McKeever, is just cleaning up on YouTube. Let's just face it. His, uh, the People are watching us on YouTube, where uh, our competition, politically speaking, such as Tim Budak, is getting like 6,000 views. We're getting 700,000 views. And that's just about where we're heading. And I thought, maybe you might want to see what it is that's attracting people to some of the things that Paul McKeever does. And we have another little 12 minute clip for you that has taken an outtake from four different things that Paul did. And um, he does these things on his own. Some have to do with politics, some have to do with him just take, picking up his camera and deciding to create a holiday. <laughs> Shall we show them about that, hey Paul? Sure. Okay. talk about Alan Greenspan, former head of the Federal Reserve, and with so many 
newspaper columnists and bloggers trying to associate um, his management of the Fed and the money supply with uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy, the time has come to discuss Ayn Rand's view or views on the morality of money and of uh, inflation. So banks, those central banks, um, over time became nationalized. Why? Well, because that's the, that's the trend of things, isn't it? Collectivism is such that governments saw central banks as a way to fund their operations. Well, why, why did they see them as a way to fund their operations? Well, they said, look, um, instead of, uh, you know, every bank issuing their own IOUs, and literally that's what happened. For example, in the 1920s, you could uh, go around in Canada and you could find Bank of Montreal dollars. They literally said Bank of Montreal. This dollar is a claim on so much gold. Um, and the same thing for Bank of Commerce, for Royal Bank. They all had their own money. They were competing currencies, if you will. We didn't have one Canadian dollar supply. They had different banks, all issuing their own money. But a central bank was, was formed that was not done against the will of banks. That was done for the banks. Um, and uh, sometimes it happened that the, these banks had organized themselves a central bank, and other times it happened that they hadn't yet done so, but the government formed one. But it happened all over the world. And the, historically, the, the case has been that governments would issue notes from the central bank, so Bank of England notes, for example, and the, the note would initially say, let's just pick a number, uh, this note can be redeemed for one ounce of gold or for one gold coin. And so people would you know, take these notes. They were lighter. They were convenient. They knew that they, the government was good for it. They wouldn't lie. So they, they would, you know, exchange these notes and they could reliably be exchanged for, for other property or for services. The question is for uh, Mr. McKeever. Um, you know, I've been reading some of the stuff that you've put out and I'm just wondering, you've mentioned a few things about pandering and this really isn't about the census. Nobody really cares about the census. It's more about pandering to a portion of the Conservative Party or those who, who vote Conservative who are being disillusioned. Maybe if you can comment on that as a Libertarian. Well, just for clarification, I'm not a Libertarian, okay. I'm, a, I'm a capitalist, but... Um, okay. Very good, I apologize. We can talk about for, later. As a capitalist. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, the, the uh, context of what you're talking about was a, as a something I had written in which I had said that there is a political purpose that can be served by proposing making the long-form census voluntary. And the political purpose uh, to which I was pointing was simply that um, there are those who do call themselves libertarian, for example, or libertarian conservatives, uh, who are um, uh, not in favor, like myself, they are not in favor of someone uh, requiring them to tell, identify their race, sex, religion, and et cetera, at the point of a gun or a fine or imprisonment. So um, although the other part of my argument was that I did not think that there's really a substantive problem uh, with, with uh, making the census uh, voluntary because there are, um, it's, it's more s uh, form than substance. I think that this data uh, is available already outside of the census and that this is more an overture to those who think that maybe the conservatives are more um, friendly with the social conservatives than they are with those who are sort of free market types. It's, a, it's an olive branch, if you will, although I'm not sure how effective it will be. Thank you, Mr. McKeever. Thank you, Mr. But everybody Rita. knows our medical system is cash-strapped. When refugees come here, they get automatic medical, basically free everything. And based on our first caller here and the concerns that were expressed, what does Canada do based on what our laws are on people showing up at our front door? What are we to do? Well, I, I think there's two things. One, of course, you, you have to be careful about who comes in, although the general rule should be anybody who wants to come can. That's how it has been. Yeah, and, and that's fine with me. Um, to my mind, it's not. I don't care what you look like, but the one thing that does concern me about policy is we don't care enough about what people think like. And so, for example, during, during uh, the, the Cold War, I wouldn't want KGB agents from Russia to be given voting rights in Canada.
Um, and likewise, if we're currently at, at war with theocracy in the Middle East, I think that if you're sympathetic, you haven't committed a crime necessarily, but if you say, oh no, I, I, I think that democracy is evil, well, I don't think that that's a candidate for Canadian citizenship. That's mm -hmm. my own view. But apart from that, the system that's broken is not so much the immigration system, but as I was saying earlier, the healthcare system. We cannot make no system in which everyone pays in and then we ration out health care. Uh, a, can, la can last, uh, B, can ever provide quality health care, or C... You're talking about feasibility here, it's, plain and simple. It's an economic death. I mean, I think it's also morally wrong to take money from people who aren't getting paid or aren't, get, aren't receiving the services that they're paying for. But even as a matter of economics, it's not sustainable. And as the population of people that come in who aren't putting money into the system increases, there's going to be both pressure on this on the system to make smaller rations for everyone and there's going to be huge racist resentment huge uh, huge, huge. Uh, it's it's wrong and i think we've got to rethink socialized health care mm -hmm. oh, yeah. the average north american consumes five times more than a mexican ten times more than a chinese person and thirty times more than a person from india <laughs> We are the most voracious consumers in the world. A world that could die because of the way we North Americans live. Give it a rest. November 23 is Buy Nothing Day. Hello folks, it's November 23rd, 2007. In the United States, this day is known as Black Friday, the first shopping day of the uh, busy retail Christmas season. And it's celebrated one day after Thanksgiving. I'm proposing that from this day forward, rational people not refer to this as Black Friday, but rather Reasons Harvest. Okay, we're going to put the beans into this nuclear powered device. Because most of the electricity in Ontario comes from production of electricity using nuclear power. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but that is some nice freshly ground coffee. And I'm going to put that right over here in my Bodum. Bodum it's called. I think that's just the brand name or it could be the device. It's basically a coffee press. And now I'll just click a button and do what my ancestors did with hours of wood collection and rubbing sticks together. Uh, I'll do in about three minutes here with the assistance of the human mind, electricity, copper mines, and etc. some of my friends at my favorite sushi place. Oh yeah. Look at that wonderful there. food and the prices Thank are great. You. Thank you. Maybe there you my go. This is rad right now. <laughs> Happy shopping day. Oh, yeah. What do I I'm calling it Reasons Harvest today. Oh, okay. And I'm telling everybody go thank yourself. So in other words, go out and buy yourself something good and be happy. Yeah. Like some sushi for example. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, have Mom. a good day. And here I am at McDonald's about to have a Big Mac from one of the world's largest uh, and richest uh, providers of fast food. And here's a small and tasty and inexpensive reward. Mm. Wonderful. Hey guys. Hey, welcome to HMV. Hello. It's my new toy, and I'm here to purchase some tanning hours. Okay. Hey, you. How's it going? Not too bad. I got my video camera here. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks a lot for embarrassing me. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm Thank celebrating you. a very special day of the year. Everyone knows it as uh, Reasons Harvest. And on, okay. yes, it's the day when we celebrate being wealthy and making a lot of money. Excellent. Yeah. 
And so we go out, we buy things for ourselves. Sweet. To make ourselves happy. Yes. And so... You can't buy happiness, you know. Oh, yes, you can. No, you can't. In fact, you can't, you can't have happiness without buying it. Or trading for it, at least. Mm -hmm. So I would like to buy your biggest tan package. Let's see what you got over here. Let's see. You've got 500, 500 minutes. minutes for 140. You got a deal for me? That is your deal. That is my deal? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know... Well, let's see what we have here first. Okay. Now, you know, on uh, Reason's Harvest, mm -hmm. we have a saying. Everybody has a saying. It's supposed to say. And it's, go thank yourself. You say it loud and proud. Oh, go thank so yourself. You, go thank yourself. Go thank yourself. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So what are we going to do? You're going to sell me 143 minutes? Or no? I'll sell you 500 minutes. 500 minutes for $143. Yes. I would gladly pay for that. And it's going to make my skin healthy and glowing and glowing and yes. it will be just great for vitamin D right excellent for vitamin D yes and look at all these products you've got up here that people can buy and these aren't cheap products these and are just great products we're getting right? lots of nuances in the next week or two as well is that right yeah right on well, let's get me in there and I have your favorite bed available which is number eight <laughs> for 19 minutes <laughs> So this is called, what's it called? Reasons Harvest. Reasons Harvest. Right. And I've just got a recruit for next year. Um, November 23rd, I'll be there. That's right. Spending my money. Or whatever the day is after the American Thanksgiving. Okay. Yeah, right on. And we're going to make as much as we possibly can that day. Yeah. And we're going to buy as much as we possibly can. Okay. All right? Can I spend more than I make? Yes, but you've okay. got to, you've got to en enlist at least five friends for next year. Okay, done. Done. I already have friends. <laughs> Maybe even ten. Well, Paul, you know how to celebrate freedom. I gotta give you that. <laughs>